Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Have you heard the idea before that a person needs a special outpouring of the Holy Spirit in order to be saved? Not just to believe in Jesus as their Savior, but you have to have this additional special outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes this idea is referred to as the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And it's claimed that this is different from regular baptism with water and God's Word. Often this kind of baptism of the Spirit is described as a a kind of special supernatural experience or feeling that overwhelms a person. Perhaps it's manifested in in uncontrollable weeping, or perhaps in, in being physically knocked over without anybody touching or pushing you down, or perhaps by some other miracle, for example, being able to miraculously speak in tongues in some uh, supernatural language of the angels or some other language. However, as we see in our sermon text for today from Romans chapter 8, the way the Bible describes it in, in this and many other places in the New Testament, all believers in Jesus as the Savior have the Holy Spirit living within us as a gift by the pure grace of God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3, the Apostle Paul says, No one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So if you believe in Jesus as your Savior from sin, the Apostle Paul says that there is no doubt about it. You have the Holy Spirit living within you. The question for us today that is raised by the Apostle Paul's exhortation to us in our reading from Romans chapter 8 is, are you using this gift from God of the Holy Spirit? Are you living by the Spirit? And it's important for us to honestly confront the implied answer that is provided in our text that we are not living by the Spirit, at least not to the extent that we could be and should be. In verse 12 of our reading, the Apostle Paul points out that we owe something. We have an obligation to use the gift of the Holy Spirit here and now in our everyday lives. The same Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead will manifest his power and his presence and also raise our bodies back to life from the dead on the last day when Jesus returns in judgment. What about right now? Paul says that the same Spirit manifests himself right now in our everyday living. And he says that that is why we have an obligation to fulfill. Now, he doesn't mean that we have to live in a certain way in order to maintain our status as God's children. Rather, he says that since we are God's people by God's grace, now our life has a special purpose. We're bound to live the new life that the Spirit gives to us. We owe it to our Creator, to our Redeemer, God, to live the new life that he has given to us. And we can do that only because we are led by the Spirit of God, as Paul writes in verse 14. If we back up and look at the verses before, uh, these selected verses of our reading, earlier in chapter 8, in verse 2, the Apostle Paul talks about the struggle between the law of the Spirit of life and the law of sin and death. And he says that in Christ Jesus, we have been set free from the law of sin and death. As if that victory because of Jesus was already a foregone conclusion. However, we see as as the Apostle Paul describes in the previous chapter, in chapter 7, that that spiritual conflict rages within us and, and it affects us deeply. Both of those forces are at war within us. Both of those forces are more powerful than we are. As Paul writes, we are also involved actively in that struggle as both our sinful nature works together with that law of sin and death, 
but also our new self, given by the Holy Spirit through faith in Jesus as our Savior, works through the power of the Spirit who lives within us. We see that a, a spiritual life doesn't happen automatically at all, just because we have that gift of the Holy Spirit himself within us. Paul says that we have an obligation, because we have the Spirit, to use that gift in living to the glory of God. Remember that. You and I have an obligation. We have an active part that God calls us to play. We have decisions to make in our day-to-day lives that will either glorify God or that will bring shame and dishonor to his name. When it comes to spiritual life, everything is important and nothing is to be taken casually. Right here, we need to have our eyes and ears wide open because here there is great danger for God's people. Very easy for us having become comfortable with our own lifestyle, we we sometimes might not see very much need to grow in our spiritual life. So without realizing it, we may slip into a pattern of no longer being ambitious and striving for the things of the Spirit. And as a result, we can kind of lapse into a a kind of spiritual neutrality or, or apathy. And to this, the Apostle Paul says, no, we dare not become spiritually lazy. We dare not become careless, lackadaisical, and indifferent to spiritual matters. We are Christians. We bear the name of Christ. The Spirit of God himself dwells within us, and therefore, we have an obligation to live for him now by the power that he himself has given to us. Perhaps some of you here today have played in the past or perhaps in very recently on a successful sports team or certainly you've seen one portrayed on the little or big screen. Very often in those portrayals you see that in spite of that team's success, the coach continues to drive them hard in practice and he warns them not to get arrogant or else they might take their winning for granted and become lazy and sloppy in their play. And end up getting beaten by teams that are far less skilled than they are. That's very similar to the Apostle Paul's concern for us Christians in this reading. We have been baptized. Many of us have been confirmed in the Christian faith. We go to church and we receive the Lord's Supper. All too often we can slip into that pattern of thinking that we're in pretty good shape spiritually, when in actuality perhaps our our Christian life may in fact have become pretty lazy and sloppy. And so Paul spells out clearly for us the options that are available. We either aspire toward the things of the Spirit or toward the things of the sinful nature. Since we are Christians, and since we have received the gift of the Holy Spirit and the promise of the resurrection from the dead, since we have received from God blessing after blessing from his grace, we have an obligation to use this gift of the Spirit. Or really, to look at it from another way, to let the Spirit use us. We're not just to take a step with the Spirit once in a while, but to go on a lifelong walk with him every step of the way. We have an obligation to become all that we possibly can be. Even in regard to suffering, the Apostle Paul writes, because as he says in verse 19, creation is waiting with eager longing for the sons of God to be revealed. This is very exciting for us to consider. God's original desire when he created Adam and Eve and the whole world in perfection was that all of humanity would be in perfect harmony with him, would live under him as king and lord, and serve one another gladly and willingly. But when sin entered the world, people threw off that lordship of God and began serving only themselves. But God, in his mercy, did not give up on the crown of his creation. He planned what we might become by the power of his Spirit through his Son, Jesus, the Savior. 
God is like a sculptor. And the Holy Spirit is his chisel. As God looks at us, just as a sculptor looks at a rough block of marble, he sees great potential in what that final product might be. He sees what he can create and form and fashion out of us, making us what he first originally intended people to be in harmony with him and with each other as his children and his heirs who recognize his kingship and who cry out as his children, Abba, Father, dear Dad, dear Father in heaven. Since we have his spirit, it is our obligation to become all that we possibly can be through the Spirit's power. And that can only be achieved, as the Apostle Paul writes in verse 16, when the Spirit himself joins our spirit in testifying that we are God's children. Think for a moment, just even apart from a connection with the Holy Spirit through faith in Jesus, of the remarkable resilience of the human spirit. Think about the spirit of refugees struggling against all odds for survival. Consider the remarkable creativity of the human spirit in in crafting works of beauty and grandeur. In many ways, we see glorious potential in human beings whom God created and whom he endowed with natural talents and abilities. But now consider what can happen as these human spirits are fused with the power and majesty of the Spirit of God, as the Spirit himself joins our spirit. And the result is even greater and more magnificent deeds that will bring greater glory to our Father in heaven. So that's the Apostle Paul's challenge to each one of us, to become all that we can be through his Spirit who lives within us. And so since we are obligated to use the power of the Holy Spirit that has been given to us in living righteously and putting to death the misdeeds of the sinful nature and at the same time becoming all that God wants us to be, let us look to Jesus not only as our example, but also as the source of our spiritual power. At his baptism in the Jordan River, Jesus received the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon him. And the voice of his Father in heaven spoke, This is my Son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. And then immediately, filled with the Holy Spirit, Jesus went out into the wilderness for his personal confrontation with the devil. From that cosmic conflict, Jesus emerged triumphant again in the power of the Spirit only years later to meet again with that evil foe on the cross of Calvary. And in that case, in that final struggle, he defeated the evil enemy once and for all. And again, he did that by the power of the Spirit. And now he has given that same Spirit to us, his people. That same Spirit that filled Jesus then lives now in you and me. There is no doubt about it. We have been baptized and have the fullness of the Holy Spirit. We have received the benefits of the death and resurrection of Jesus our Savior. We have been made sons and daughters, dearly loved by our Heavenly Father for Jesus' sake. Therefore, by the power of the Spirit, let us fulfill our obligation to live by the Spirit who has given us life. Let us use his gifts and be used by him so that he can make us all that he wants us to be. Amen.